I don't know. I've, I've played, I've performed live a few times and it's been massively successful, but I still have that voice in the back of me. Are people thinking I'm too old? Uh, do I look stupid up here? It's dreadful, you know, but, mm. but you've got to forget about that and just think of the music. Just think of the music. And when people enjoy your music, that's all that matters. You can have two heads. Doesn't matter. Welcome to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast with Brie Noble. Brie is a musician, entrepreneur, speaker, and founder of Women of Substance Music Radio and Podcast. Brie's interviews with successful female musicians and industry pros are both inspirational and informational. She also answers your questions about the music business. Brie is on a mission to help you create great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business, and to truly become a female entrepreneur musician. Hey, this is Brie Noble, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast today, where we talk about making great music, connecting with your audience, and growing your business. And we're going to talk today about how you can grow your business through house concerts. My guest today is the founder of House Concerts Australia, Lisa J. Aston. Lisa is one of those go-getters, those action takers that I totally identify with. Back in the mid-2000s, she found out about house concerts from an artist friend of hers, and she wondered why there was nobody doing this in Australia. And so instead of just wondering, she went out and created House Concerts Australia to create this network of combining the hosts or potential hosts with the artists who wanted to do house concerts. And if you know anything about me and the training that I present I love house concerts. I think they are the number one best way for independent artists to make money and to make super fans. You can really, really get to know your fans well, get to know what they want, get to know what they love about your music, and just become friends with your fans, which will make them so much more likely to support you when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, when you're raising money for something, when you're selling a new album. So I highly recommend if you haven't done house concerts yet that you check into doing those and I've got something that will help you. I have created a training called Profitable House Concerts and I am going to give you a special coupon just for listening to this podcast. All you need to do is go to femusician.com, that's femmusician.com, click on the training tab and go down to Profitable House Concerts And when you enroll in that course, if you put in the coupon code podcast, you will get $50 off on that course. The Profitable House Concerts course is the A to Z of what you need to know to run a successful and profitable house concert. Everything from how to book house concerts, how to market them, how to set them up for success, what kind of stuff to perform, and how to set up a system where you receive good money for your performance. In fact, because my guest Lisa today is such an expert in house concerts, having set up the House Concerts Australia site, I asked her to review my course just to see if I might be missing anything or you know any suggestions that she give, could give me. And I was so excited when she came back to me and said, you know what, not only is your course comprehensive, but you've got some things in there that I hadn't even thought of. So she gave me a ringing endorsement. You can see it on our sales page there. So go over to the uh, femusician.com, click on training, go to the Profitable House Concerts tab, and it'll take you right to the course. You can read what Lisa says about our course, all the modules inside the course, and remember to use the coupon code podcast to get $50 off. I've got students making anywhere from $200 to $500 and more on a single house concert. So I definitely think that getting this training is worth your time and your investment because one house concert can recoup any money that you spend learning how to do it, and then you can just repeat it over and over again. So that being said, I want to get into my interview with Lisa J. Aston. She has so much experience beyond house concerts even in her 
first several years in the music industry, and I can't wait for you to learn all about her and all that she has to teach you today. With over 30 years of creative and professionally rewarding experiences within artistic and creative endeavors, ranging from project management, media coordinating, arts management, publicity, musicianship, filmmaking, directing and producing, publishing, lecturing, authorship, and creative writing, Lisa J. Aston is the principal of House Concerts Australia, the largest network of house concert artists, hosts, and concert goers in Australia. Here's my interview with Lisa J. Aston. So that's a little bit about Lisa Aston. So Lisa, is there anything that's not in your little bio that I read that maybe you'd like to let our listeners know about you that's maybe a little unique or different, interesting? Um, yes, I am a huge animal rights supporter mm -hmm. and animal justice supporter. And uh, and I work now in the animal field. So I've, I've found a way to kind of combine music with my animal work, but I am an animal Reiki master or a Sui Reiki master, and I teach animal Reiki to people that want to learn it. Um, so that's a that's an interesting field for me to have been channeled into. Um, but the music works also well with the healing. So it's a part of me that took a long time to come out, kind of like a a hidden passion really, but um, I'm very happy with the work that I do. And I've, I've now recently part of the Animal Justice Party here in Australia, which is all about um, giving them a voice and giving them rights and, um, and making their life much better than what it currently is. So that's a big part of me, big part of my heart, I think. Yeah. Mm, that is really cool. And it's cool that you've been able to, to combine that with music in some way. Yeah, because you know, sometimes you go through life and particularly when you've been doing one thing for many, 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 many years and it, you get to a point in your life, which for me, which is music, by the way, and then you get to a point in your life and you think there's something more that I need to do, but it's do I have to leave this first thing behind? Do I have to leave this passion behind to follow yeah. another passion or is it possible for the two to meld? And I, you know, it took me maybe two or three years to figure out how that worked. Um, and eventually it, I found that it worked via using uh, music or utilizing my songs, my music or writing for, um, for various animal charities or, or healing centers or um, animal hospitals um, that needed to raise money. So, you know, you, when you think about it, you think, why did that take two or three years? I mean, that looks pretty pretty damn obvious, but it's not something that immediately comes to mind because you've been following a path of a certain type of music writing and and what you were writing for and what your aims were originally, what your focus was about, what you deemed as uh, being your success in that field. And then when you move across to a healing field, music is healing, yes, but to a, another form of healing, you don't immediately correlate the two. So it, it did take some time and I did leave music behind for a while. And uh, that's, that's I guess, for another question. But um, yeah, my pilot light was, was way down low for mm. quite a while. Yeah. Mm, well, we will definitely get there. But I, first, I'd love to find out how you got started in music. Well, I've always loved music. I think my mum asked me, I think I was about five years old, and um, she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a singer. And, um, or, you know, words to that effect. And I remember her response. She said, you know, you really need to think seriously about what you're going to do when you grow up, because I can count on one hand the people that are successful, the girls that are successful singers in the world, and you really need to think about a career, maybe like a secretary or hairdresser or something like that. And and I, you know, I've always been a really a grown up child. You know, grow, grew up as a, a single child with four adults in an apartment, um, and. I, and I was always more serious than other kids, you know, and that's what I wanted to do. 
And fortunately, uh, my grandfather bought me a, I think it was a made of hard plastic or something, some guitar thing. And, and in those days, we used to have heaters. I don't know what you call them in the States, but, you know, the electric heaters. And, and it kind of looked like a, a big cardboard box. And I used to stand on top of that and make my grandfather listen to my songs that weren't actually songs. They were woeful. But fortunately, he was deaf as a post and he just clapped and cheered and thought I was wonderful. And that gave me interestingly it's the small things in life gave me the confidence that that had my mum had kind of shattered so I'd always loved music and when I went to school I wanted to learn an instrument and I wanted to learn piano but because we lived on the second top floor of an apartment block and in those days we didn't have electric pianos we had uprights or you know baby grands and that was not going to happen up a stairwell so uh, mum said look, if you go to, you know, you're insisting on this music thing, learn the violin. And I thought, no, <laughs> no, don't want to learn violin. But she said to me, she's a very complex woman. She said to me, but the thing is, if you learn the strings, you can play any stringed instrument. And I thought, well, yeah, that makes sense. I was kind of like eight or nine at this stage. So I learned violin at school under Catholic nuns, and it was rather – interesting because I'm left-handed but they forced me to learn right-handed and every time I screwed up I got the feather duster over the hand so I learned to play right-handed really really well um, so that was kind of my foray into learning and mum was right after that I, I taught myself guitar and then I started singing I could always sing but I started singing around the restaurants in Sydney and making a little bit of pocket money and and then I figured, wouldn't it be nice to play with some other musicians? So through an ad in the paper, um, I was about 17, I found this girl who was a drummer and I played acoustic guitar. Well, as you can imagine, there wasn't a great, great thing happening with a drum set and an acoustic guitar, but we were, we were you know, relatively amateurish. So we put a little band together, but in Sydney at the time, this was in the mid 70s, we couldn't find any female bass players. We had a keyboard player, we had a, a drummer, we had a guitarist were plenty, but there were no bass players. So I said, well, look, I learned violin, it can't be that different. So I picked up a bass and I started playing and I taught myself the bass. And from there, um, life kind of happened and I ended up singing with a big seven piece band in Sydney. And then um, my little band that I'd started with, we were all female, had, you know, broken up over the time, but reunited in Perth. And they had an ad in, this, in the paper in Sydney. This is funny, isn't it? Divine intervention. And I was reading the paper in the musicians column because I was always scouring for good musicians. And there was this ad saying, Perth, all female Perth band looking for bass player. And I thought, get out. This can't be the girls. And I rang and it was. And they actually had called themselves the girls. So I flew over to Perth and um, and played bass in this band. <clears throat> and it was, it was absolutely brilliant. So – and then I came back to – you know, I fell in love over there and left the band for a guy, which we girls tend to do. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. And um, and then, you know, life took a different turn. So I kept with kept with the music, but, um, but yeah, made some pretty silly decisions when, you know, when uh, when romance stepped in. So mm. that was that took me on a different road altogether. So do you do you wish that you had continued the performing route? Because I know you did stick with music, but you you know we'll talk about that in a minute. But do you do you wish that you would have stayed performing with that group? You know, I had some regrets for a while, and then I thought there is a reason a reason for everything, and um, and life is just an interesting path and an interesting journey. And I couldn't go back. There was there was no going back after I left them. The band broke up, and and I'm not saying mm. that I was the cement that held them together, but it just the, they lost the vibe altogether, mm. and you know it, people went their different ways. And do I regret it? Um, I think we could have gone further. I think I let them down. I think I was pretty selfish at the time. That I regret. But taking a different path that led me 
to where I am today? Not really. No. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Bands are so hard. I mean, I've, I've been in plenty of them and it's just, it's such a, it's like a marriage basically. And it's so hard when something changes to, like you said, keep that same vibe. It is. And uh, I think, I don't know whether this makes a difference or not, but being an all girl band um, was a much better thing to do. Um, interestingly, there were four of us in the band and two, two of the girls were lesbian and two weren't. And I was one of the ones that wasn't. And it didn't matter who did what. It really did not matter who did what. But it, the bond that it created as being an all-female unit was something that I had um, not been able to share in bands where there's girls and guys. It was a completely different dynamic and one that I thought, um, <clears throat> pardon me, was was really interesting because when we all played our individual instruments, it came from a, a different place than when you are in a band with guys that play instruments. But I, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but it just seemed to come from more of an emotive performance rather than a, a, a get it right analytical kind of performance. Mm, yeah, I can see what you're saying. And, and also, yeah. obviously, you guys had a camaraderie. Sometimes oh. that's hard to get with the males and females together because I've been in both yeah. different kinds of bands. And yeah. in an all-female band, when things are going well and everybody's on the same page, there really is that synergy thing. There is. There is. It's it's a really interesting um it's a really interesting dynamic and it kind of moves as a one thing. And the thing that you've got to tackle with is the emotion because being girls and being during, you know, during that time of your life where, you know, you've got girl things going on in your body and hormones are up and down all over the shop and you've got good moods and bitchy moods and happy moods and crying moods and, you know, someone's upset and having a bad day so doesn't want to go to band practices. <laughs> There's all these different dynamics and things that happen in all-girl bands, you know, that guys don't have to kind of deal with, I think. So not that's not that's true and you yeah. you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing it with them anyway usually. not really no <laughs> <laughs> so so what happened after that how where did you go after you left the band and i know you you ended up working in music how did that come to happen well um i was working uh in an advertising agency this is kind of you know how you kind of go through life and you have flat spots or what i call you know roundabouts where you just find yourself standing like Alice in Wonderland in the middle of nowhere going, what the, where do I go mm. now? And I found mm. myself um, working as a receptionist in an advertising agency in Sydney. And um, <clears throat> that was kind of fun. It was fun. And uh, I was the worst person for the job, I tell you, because all <laughs> I do was just have fun with everybody. But at the time I was still playing music because one of the girls that was in the band in Perth came back to Sydney and we kept in touch. So we created a three-piece band and we were playing around Sydney whilst I was working in this advertising agency. So one of the guys that worked in the agency for my birthday gave me a book, which was the very first edition of the Australian Music Industry Directory. Mm. And uh, there wasn't many pages to it. Um, but I thought, oh, this is great. I can work in the business and play in the business. So I wrote kind of a, a scratchy um, resume and um, all I said basically was I'm a musician and I want to work in the business because I had nothing mm. else behind me, you know. Uh, and I got um, – I my first response was from um, a company called MMA, which was um, the – Mark Murphy and Associates, who managed In Excess. And so they offered me the princely sum of $50 a week if I could use my own car to run around and and uh, get all their promotional material and everything dropped off all around Sydney. So it actually cost me to do the job. <laughs> but um, but a bit like the Monty Python skit, you know, having to pay to go to work. But, oh, yeah. But the, we know when, you, when you're 18 or 19 or however old I was, 20-something, um, and the prestige of being in the Sydney music industry, let alone working within excess, was just, you know, you paid for it kind of thing. So, and it would look good on my resume, I figured. 
So I did that job for a, a couple of you know months or so, and and started the fan club for In Excess actually. So it was 1984, I think. Wow, I was going to say, what year was that? So they've already at that point they've even broken into the US. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they were. Um, I remember they were in Japan doing the swing tour. I think when I started with them, and there was like hundreds of letters and stuff, and no one to re- from all from fans, you know, and the Japanese were sending all sorts of weird, and wonderful, wacky toys and things, and <sighs> and and no one was actually writing back to them or handling any of the um, any of the fans' materials. So that was kind of my job to to get all of that sorted and you know, create the fan club. So I did that. But while I was there, I got a phone call from um, a woman named Kathy Howard, who was a business partner of Michael Chug. And for your listeners, some of you may know the Frontier Touring Company, um, Michael Gadinsky, Mushroom Records. These are the big wheels of, of Australian music. And Kathy asked me if I could do two weeks at, uh, at, Michael Chug Management, which was the Sydney office of Frontier, which were essentially based in Melbourne, at two weeks while their receptionist was uh, away on maternity leave, having her baby. And she said, you know, we can pay you proper wage. And I went, oh, how nice, a job that you actually earn money at, I'll do it. So I quit at in, in excess and I only I, I knew I only had two weeks work, but I, I figured what the hell, you know, what the hey-ho. It's, mm. it's money and, and it's another thing for my resume. So off I went and it turns out the receptionist didn't want to come back. So I stayed on and um, and what I learned there was was unbelievable because it was also, it was all on the one floor. It was not only Michael Chug Management who looked after all the major Australian acts um, management-wise, but also the international touring acts for Frontier that came through Sydney also were dealt with in that office. And on the same floor of the building was the Harbour Agency, which was the biggest booking agency in Australia. Um, So we were all on the one floor. And what I learned from those days and the people I met and the experiences I got from, you know, learning event management and promotion and publicity and marketing and artist management and how agencies work. And it was priceless, absolutely priceless. Oh, I can imagine. So what are some specific things that you learned that you ended up using in your own career? Um, I think learning how the wheels work. That was the most important thing because I think uh, when you're a, an aspiring artist, it's not something that you wake up one morning and discover you are. It's something that I believe is is a God-given gift. It's a blessing and it's a part of your DNA. It's, it's food. It's your soul food. So you have to do it. And along with that comes some pretty big dreams. And I remember I was going to be um, – a world famous singer and my big dream was to do a gig in Honolulu. That was my big dream. Don't ask (laughs) me why Honolulu, but that was my big dream. And I was absolutely determined it was going to be a simple path. How hard can it be? I can sing, I can play music, I have a dream, it's going to happen. But, and you need that, you need dreams, don't get me wrong. But learning what I learned in this business is that all of the mechanics behind it that make a career work or not work and the players that are involved. And so just kind of the big dream of all I need is a record deal and I've made it is the biggest misconception that I saw and it changed my thinking because the bi- the best thing you can do for yourself, which – which I learned, which I've applied, is to go for a publisher, a music publisher, because, you know, one song can buy you a house. One song can can keep you going for, forever, especially if you, you know, secure something in a TV show or something that goes on and on, like Friends, you know, that TV show Friends. So, mm-hmm. um, and you remember Dawson's Creek, you know, a uh, Sixpence None the Richer had that one track, Kiss Me. I think that's the song. I'm not sure. But, you know, they just went boom. 
overnight from that simple 10 seconds or 15 seconds of that track as the theme for that movie or for that TV show, I should say. So what I learned was that there are there are wheels that turn your career and they're all important parts of it. You need the booking agencies to secure you the work. You need the publicists to get your name out there and TV spots and that sort of thing. You need the managers to get out there and, and network for you and, you know, find the best deals for you and negotiate with your rec- with a record company to secure you that. But, you you know, and you've also the understanding of how publishers and record companies work hand in hand and, and, you know, how how all the cogs fit together to make the wheel that turns your career. So in answer to your question, how did I apply it to myself, I chose a certain prong, a certain cog, and I chose to go just for music publishers because I'm not that keen on live performance, never have been. But it's an individual thing. But if, if your passion is to be on the stage and performance and with the spotlight on you, it's crucial for you to understand how all of that industry works. And I know that nowadays it's a little different because, you know, we've got the elevator. I call it the the elevator to the top, which is essentially your talent shows, the voice and, um, you know, Australia's got talent and Britain's got talent. Everybody's got talent, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and everybody's got everybody's talent. Everybody's got talent. But to me it's like I, I can't – personally, I can't watch those shows because – Yes, there's been some amazing singers uncovered, but I think, you know, it's it's it sounds to me like certain streams, they're looking for certain, they're looking for a certain sound. So you get this season of, of vocal acrobatics or then you might get a season of another type of voice that they're looking for. I'm not really sure. And we're such sensitive creatures, we artists, we really are. And I mean, a thousand people can tell us we're fabulous and one person says you suck and that's enough to kind of put us in victory, you know, for the next six months. So that is so true. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I've experienced that myself. And I, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, talking to myself rationally going, look at all these people that love what you do. And this one person is giving you, you know, a bad review, but yeah. you know, you still, you can't stop thinking about that. No, you can't because, you know, and it's, and it goes past an ego thing. It it really does. People might say, oh, that's just your ego getting in the way. No, it's not. And I had to think about this for some time. And it, I go back to saying that I believe that people, artists are born with a gift. I also believe architects are born with a gift. You know, mm. whatever your passion is, whatever your vocation is, whatever floats your boat is part of your soul. It's part of what you're here for. It's part of your purpose. And so for artists in particular, or any creative artist, we bear our soul. We we expose our truth. We expose what we truly believe in. And when you do that, you're always going to attract the critics and the naysayers and and whatever. But but when someone criticizes something that you have spoken from your heart about, that hurts. And it hurts deeply. So it's not it's not a pride thing. It's a passion thing. And that, you know, that it, it's like someone criticizing your child and you love mm. your child deeply and it hurts you. You know, it's it's not it goes past the ego thing. So it's um uh, let me tell you something in if I can digress a little bit here. Um, I had something happen to me um, some years ago. Um, a song was um, picked up, and in the most phenomenal way, needle in a haystack thing. And um, where I lived, cottoned on to it, and sent a photographer over to take a photo and a big write-up of me in the paper because this was just a million gazillion to one event. And anyway, <clears throat> this happened in about 2006 or 2007, I think. 
so this photographer turns up. I'm I'm all dressed and I look great and blah blah and the makeup's good and all ready for my photo and I'm all nervous. And I answered the door and this photographer says, hi, how are you? And I said, I'm great. And he said, I'm here to photograph your daughter. Oh. And I went, I don't have a daughter. And he said, well, didn't she achieve this, this, this? And I said, no, I did. And he said, oh, I didn't think you were that old. Oh, nice. Ugh. And I, I don't look old for my age. Ah. I'll tell you now, I don't. And I'm not big noting myself, but it's a gene thing in my family. My mum's the same. We just, you know, don't look old, old. And I just crumbled. Ugh. I just crumbled. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to take my photo. Everyone's going to see it. They're going to see an old person's mm. achieve this thing in a young person's environment. Oh, my God. Honestly, I just wanted to die. I just wanted to die. And that pushed me out of music for a long time. Oh my gosh, that one comment. That one comment. Oh, that's Christmas. so terrible. And I mean, I've heard other things like that as well. And it's just, it's so, you know, I have a student actually who someone told her at age 29, well, it's already too late for you. Yeah. You know, and she's like, what? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So how do you combat it? Uh, you know, how do you combat it? I think, <clears throat> I think you've just got to come back to, you know, maybe perhaps realigning yourself and your thoughts. But did I do that successfully? I don't know. I've I've played, I've performed live a few times, and it's been massively successful. But I still have that voice in the back of me. Are people thinking I'm too old? Or do I look stupid up here? It's dreadful, you know. But mm. but you've got to forget about that and just think of the music. Just think of the music, and when people enjoy your music, that's all that matters. You can have two heads; doesn't matter, you know. It's true, and and you have. I mean, you really have to think past yourself, yes, and think about what you're robbing all these people of by not performing. Because there are people that are moved by your music. There are people that desire you to be performing, and you know, in a way, you're being a little bit selfish. But it's so hard yeah. to get past those feelings, you know. Look, it totally is, and um, I think. Was it David Suzuki that said, give me the child till they're seven years old and I'll give you the man or something like that, you know? Mm. And I think, I, I don't know, I think it stems back to that that moment in the hallway being five years old and being told you won't be successful at this. What makes you think you'll be successful at this? And, you know, it, it, it matters that you get support from those that you trust with your life um, and especially as a child. And I think... It's surprising you have to revisit that child and you have to walk through life with that child. And as the adult you, and this was something that I learned from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Oh, I've read that one. Yes. Isn't that priceless? It is. It's a great book. And spending that child date, going back with your child for a day as you, the adult, taking you, the child, out for a day and sitting them down and saying, okay, little Lisa or little Brie, let's review this. Let's go back and review the truth and what was not the truth and let's rebuild you, mm. you know, and it works. It works. It's, be mm. it's a beautiful thing and I recommend well, you it. Well, you, yeah, you've already answered my question about what book you'd recommend. That's a great, I've had a couple other guests recommend that. I've read that in the past and it's a great, a great suggestion for people to, um, to take me, take her up on. And I will put a link to it on our show notes page for this episode, because you definitely want to go grab that on Amazon. Yeah. But, um, I've got like a, a really great segue, I think, from what we were just talking about in that, you know, I have a lot of students that that have this problem, they feel like they're uncomfortable because they're older or they got back, you know, they were a mom and then they got back into music and they feel like totally out of place, but they, they have this passion driving them. And so I really encourage them to do house concerts because with house concerts, you don't have to abide by what a certain venue is expecting right. or, you know, what the people that come to that venue, they only like certain kinds of bands or, you know, with a house concert, you can go directly to the people that would already like your music find a super fan, 
have them invite their friends who they know would like your music. And you, you're already feeling comfortable before you ever get on stage. So I know that you have been involved with house concerts. In fact, you started house concerts, Australia, which is amazing to me that you, you started this. Um, what year did you start it? What prompted you to start it? And, you know, what have you seen come out of it? Okay. Well, in, 1993, I started House Concerts Australia, and it came about because uh, actually, was it 1993? No, it was 2000, and I've written something wrong in my notes here. Let me just go back. In 1993, I was actually at a university and I was managing the music department there, and I had a handful of students. It was a music project. Brilliant contemporary music project. One of my students was a performer by the name of Trissette, and she and I have stayed. Oh, I actually know Trissette. That's so cool. I was going to mention that to you. Yeah, she's a great artist. She is absolutely fantastic. It, it, I have supported her as a friend and as an artist all that time, and uh, a lot of things happened through those years. But that's another story. So. Trissette and I stayed friends right through the years. And in 2009, she contacted me from, after returning uh, from London. And we were chatting on Skype. We're just chatting away. And uh, she said to me, hey, Lise, I'm back in Australia. Do you know of any house concerts? And I said, no, what? <laughs> and she said, a house concert. I mean, and I said to her, you mean like doof doof house music? And she goes, no, like a house concert. And I said, look, I don't, I don't know what you're on about. What's a house? What's this? And she told me, she said, well, in the UK here, uh, you know, there's a, a, a network over here and, and this is what house concerts are. And she explained it all to me, how it's people perform, you know, musicians performing in your home and you have hosts and they invite guests and you perform acoustically or semi-acoustically and uh, you get to meet people and um, blah, blah, blah. And I said, wow, let me just give me a second and I'll Google and see what happens. And she said, well, I did and I found nothing. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, give me a shot. So I did and I came back to her and I said, well, it looks like somebody made an effort back in 2005 and it lasted five minutes and that's it. And I said, do you know there's nothing here? Nothing in Australia with with like millions and millions and millions of people? And she said, oh. And I said, I think we better set one up. <laughs> and she said, oh, well, I, I don't, you know, I'll help you, but I'm touring and everything. I said, I oh, don't sweat, I'll do it. So she was brilliant. She helped me set this up and, and um, we talked back and forth quite a bit and uh, and that's how it kind of came about. Yeah. So wow. from there, um, I, I talked to two people. Uh, I, I always have, my, my mantra is kind of go straight to the top, you know, so I went straight to the top and I contacted Fran Snyder, who runs Concerts in the Home there in the mm -hmm. US. And and he talked to me for ages and he was so helpful, told me the, the pitfalls and the pluses and how best to set it up and what to look out for. And uh, he was great. And then I also spoke with Rob Ellen, who runs the European Concert Hub in the UK. And between these two guys, um, they basically held my hand to walk me through and set this up. And from there, I just contacted... Um, all the, the music festival people, the folk festival people in Australia, my musician friends, um, mu music business friends. I got onto Google. I got onto Yahoo groups, anyone and everything that loved um, acoustic music, folk music, um, that were had heard of house concerts and, um, and basically – and word of mouth and Facebook and, and it kind of grew from there. Wow, that's that's awesome. So, how does it work? Do you do you have a, a centralized site? I mean, is it kind of similar to concerts in your home, where you have you know hosts and you have musicians and you match them up somehow, or they find each other? Yeah, I've set this up because it's just me on my own. Um, I set this up on a platform called Ning, 
which is mm -hmm. yeah n i n g ning and it it's it's i have you know i have to pay a monthly fee for it but that's fine because it's set up as a networking site and um, i don't have the skills to set up something as functional as what fran has um, so i wanted something that was kind of ready to go and this works perfectly so anybody can see the front page of the of the house concerts australia website but you have to be a member to get in and once you're in then you can freely network with each other and it's set up in such a way that it makes it very easy for everyone to connect with one another to invite members to post events that are coming up to to blog anything um so yeah it's it's a very user friendly site but everything about it is not is run manually because the the big thing for me in the back of my mind was privacy because we're dealing with people's homes here these are not public mm. venues <clears throat> so you've got to be very careful um that there's no kind of you know infiltration um so it's it's that's the biggest thing for me that i i've been mindful of so virtually i walk through every section of this site before approving people yeah mm. yeah mm, that's awesome so is it is it free to join is there a small fee or how does that work um hosts are free to join because they put on the events concert goers are also free to join artists pay 27 dollars australian a year which is like one wow, meal and a cup tiny. tiny yeah and and that is for three years so if you know for three years it automatically renews and then after mm. that they're life members so it's just really to help me pay for the site right yeah that's very cool i mean the fact that you're ha you've got this service for artists and you're you're doing it a lot of the work yourself i just i just think that's such, so giving and i mean are, have you actually participated in some of these house concerts or is this just a love that you're giving back to the artist's community um, I have helped hosts putting this together, uh, putting house concerts together. I haven't performed at any just yet, um, but maybe that's something I'll do in the future. I don't know, but I'm pretty busy with my practice and I'm pretty busy with, you know, other things and recording at home and recording meditations for people. And I just love studio work. Um, mm. So for me to be on the road is I'm probably too lazy. I don't know. <laughs> No, and, you're just you know, got a lot of things going on, you know. Yeah, I think it was all those years of, you know, of all the instruments to play, to choose to be in a band. The worst is the drum kits because you've got to haul everything. And the second mm. thing is being a bass player because back in the day, your bass amps were just huge. Oh, yeah. And, Massive. you know, hauling a big bass amp up and down stairs and in the rain and everywhere else, I just thought, nah. No. I don't know. A keyboard's not so easy either. I mean, I have a big, long, huge, I mean, I have like a full 88 key thing, but it's got wheels and you drag the thing. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> in the old days, I didn't have wheels on it. So I would like break my arm trying to carry this thing around. Yeah. It's like, I haven't, where are my roadies? <laughs> I know. I'm so why back. do you think? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I went off a bit there. Uh, it's okay. Why do you think that, um, that house concerts are a great outlet for indie artists? Okay. There's a lot of things. Um, some years ago in Australia, the laws changed with regards to drink driving and the the live band scene, the, the public venue scene um, died a slow death because here it, it was, you know, drinking and smoking was synonymous with bands and music in the pubs here in Australia. It's very strong. It was a very strong pub culture. And there was bands and musicians on every corner. You would just be exhausted spending the night running from one venue to the next to try and catch your mm -hmm. favourite bands. But when they brought in the drink driving laws in the 80s, that's, believe it or not, when the when the Dubais began, and people stopped going to the live venues because they couldn't smoke and, and oh, well, they couldn't drink. They could still smoke cigarettes, but they couldn't drink anymore. Taxis were expensive. Uh, so they kind of ended up, you know, not going to the venues and then they brought in no smoking in public places so that cut that lot out as well and also the amount of money that artists were being paid they also cut out door deals see door deals used to be great you know mm. you 
great, get a great percentage off the door if you had a good, strong following. And back in the day, there were enough venues for you to build a strong following. But that slowly died. And there were less and less venues for musicians to play, less and less money being given out. Poker machines came in, karaoke came in, all these things were making a huge impact on live performance. So how do house concerts come into the picture and how do they help? Well, for starters, there's no fees to be taken out. There's no agency fees. There's no management fees. It's a safe environment. If people want to do what they want to do in their own home, you haven't got the you know, smoking police or the drinking police or the whatever else um, to do that. And not all people, don't get me wrong, not all people drink and smoke. They really don't. They, there are some um, you know, house concert hosts that are teetotalers and they have lovely little tea parties and variety of things. But for the artist, the main thing is that they earn 100% of their money. They get to meet people intimately. They get to meet new fans. They get to sign their CDs personally. They get to um, talk about themselves on a personal level, where they're playing, uh, what they do, what their life is, tell their story. It's almost like a storyteller event in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, they get a bed and breakfast, which is lovely. And, you know, when you're touring, you – you might not agree with me, but when you're touring, it can be damn lonely. People don't see the behind the scenes things when you go back to your hotel and it's. Oh no, I totally agree. You know, I, it's, it's. A and damn then you get this, you have, it's this weird dichotomy of having a million people around you and then. And no one to no talk one. to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one to talk to because in a, you know, in a live performance, like a venue, you, there, it's an us and them thing. Not while the show is on, but when the show is over, they go home. You go your way. But at a house concert, you get to stay the night. You get bed and breakfast. You get to, you know, relax. You get to talk to people. And you can sell your merchandise there. You can sign things. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a personal thing. And I find that's a benefit. And also all the money is yours oh, as you negotiate with the host. And no fees because by the time you – you know, if you're paying live, playing live venues, by the time you've paid your manager and paid your agent and, you know, whatever else or who else you've got to pay and your, your traveling costs and all this sort of thing uh, and the hire of the venue, all these costs, you know, you're not having to face. So I think yeah, a huge advantage. Yeah, no, I totally, I'm completely on the same page with you. And it's why I recommend to my students that they get started with house concerts because it's just it's such a win-win for an indie artist, I think. It is. And also the people are there to listen to you. You have a hundred percent of their focus and that's a big, big plus. Yeah. You're not sharing the bill. You're not having to get on somebody else's bill and just be an opener and nobody wants to be there to see you because they came to see the other person. You know, everyone's there exactly. to see you. Exactly. They're there to see you. That's it. And it's a brilliant way to connect on a personal level. <clears throat> yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, you have, so, you have so much that you've done in your career over the years. And so I want to actually move on to ask you one question about the placements that you've gotten. You've gotten, uh, like you said, you went directly to publishers and that was kind of the route that you chose. Mm -hmm. And you've gotten some great placements for, you know, TV and also like getting your songs used by fundraising opportunities. And so I wanted you to find out a little bit from you, you know, kind of what your secrets were to getting into those placements. Well, I think that the way that I did it was was personal – with the fundraisers, it was personal contact. I actually went to these people's websites and uh, and I looked at the work that they did and I saw that they were looking for ways to raise money and I contacted them and said, this is who I am, this is what I do, here's a sample of my work, can I help you? And they would mm. come back and say, "That look, this would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And, you know, just by doing small things like that, you you get to raise your profile by association. Um, for example, one of the one of the works that uh, one of the fundraisers that one of my songs was attached to was for the orangutan project to raise money for um, the orangutans because they're losing their habitat in Indonesia because of all the palm oil. And the orangutan project people made a video with one of Australia's most prolific actresses, Cornelia Francis, 
and she held a little baby orangutan as she spoke through the video and my music was in the background. And at the end, when they gave all the credits, there was my name and my song. So that was a wonderful way for me to get my work exposed to thousands of people um, that I would ordinarily probably not have been accessible to. So I highly recommend contacting uh, people. Just go straight to the top. There's my mantra again. Just go straight to the people, <laughs> you know, that know it because if you go through the the some of, sometimes if you go through the cogs, it can take a very long time. With music publishers, um, an interesting thing, I, uh, I locked in or I had, based on one song, I was offered a full publishing deal um, with, with um, a company in Sydney, Republic Productions. And again, this was all the cream of the cream based on one song of mine, which was called Angel Heart. And uh, they signed me for an album. Mm. Right, they loved it, and uh, based on this one song. So I was at the meeting, and some one of them said, "You know, go out and grab a bottle of." Gave one of the office uh, personnel some money. Go grab a bottle of Moe, and we'll celebrate. And the guy comes back with this, what I could call a sample bottle. It was like the smallest bottle of Moe I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> and said, "This is all they had." And we all laughed except one guy who said, "I hope this isn't a sign of things to come." Mm. And I thought, oh, great comment. Thanks so much. But what happened is that the rest of my album, because I write in multiple genres, there was some country, there was some blues, there was some, there, there was, there was not another pop, pop, pop song like Angel Heart. And they had a great difficulty in trying to get other people to record multiple genres of music off this album. So they did nothing with it. They just wanted mm. to focus on pop. So, but that was my experience. But again, I think that music publishing is definitely the way to go. I've had, I've had success with placing my music with companies such as Moo Moo Music in Australia here, and they provide music that goes to cafes and um, all, all different music outlets that pipe music, restaurants, um, oh, I don't know, not elevators, thankfully, but <laughs> a, a lot of places that use um, that use music, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. I've I've had some very good success with with all of my songs because they're all different. So I recommend that if you happen to be one of those writers that writes in multiple genres, um, filtering your music through uh, bodies like that is awesome because you get. A, uh, you know tentacles everywhere and it's a great source of in of income for you yeah i think you made a really good point about that one song could buy you a house i mean it's true oh, yeah that art artists don't think about that about the songwriting royalties that you can get from one song even if it's recorded by someone else oh yeah and you know another bug Another thing that's a bug in my ear is yeah. uh, the artists for some reason are so closed on allowing other artists to record their material. And for mm. me, for me, that is a very clever thing to do. I had, um, you might, if you cast your mind back to the, the Sydney Olympics, um, I don't know if you saw that on TV, but there I was, did. Okay. Well, you remember there was a young girl, Nikki Webster that opened the show. Um, she came down on some big balloon thing. Anyway, ah. she used my song with permission, of course, Angel Heart as her audition piece. Mm. And she got the part. Wow. Right? So using – so just me saying, well, what – I don't understand. What associate – how does that help me to have someone sing my song as an audition piece for the Olympics? But it got used. It got heard. Well, and it's great to put on your resume too. It's great. But even, you know, if you have indie artists even recording your music, they're going to work as hard as they can to promote that song because they want to be a successful artist. Yeah. So, you know, why not have someone else out there trying to promote it? If they get lucky and that song gets picked up somehow, you are going to get paid. That's right. That's right. That's why publishing is just the diamond in a coal mine. 
Yeah, He's yeah, for sure. I actually wrote a book. I forgot to mention. It's called Pop Stars and Idols, and it's a terrible title, but um, I blame one of my friends for it anyway. There you go. Palm off the <laughs> responsibility. Uh, but it's actually it's actually about the 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 mechanics. Well, I was talking at the beginning of this interview about the mechanics of the music business. So if you can get your hands on one of them, um, you can download it online too. And it's it's brilliant for explaining how you know all of this works and you know, coming back to music publishers and talking about house concerts. The one thing in Australia, I don't know if this works over there, but I had to spend some time with our performance rights body here, which is APRA, um, and talk to them about the ins and outs of, you know, performance rights at a house concert. In Australia, you cannot claim your performance rights. You can't submit your song list and get paid for that whilst performing house concerts. And the reason for that is you are an invited guest. Mm. And there's a difference. You are not, you are, you know, there, there's some very fine lines to performing house concerts in Australia. Because if you don't abide by these particular set of rules, then as a host, you will find yourself ending up needing to get council permission ah and that's a butt pain let me tell oh, you yeah you know? yeah i do i do you know i do know there's some of that in the u.s that you need to make sure like as far as maybe if you're selling tickets to your house concert you need to make sure that you're not getting in trouble for doing a business thing in a non-business zone correct. and stuff like that correct correct but i had not thought about performance rights at a house concert it actually had not crossed my mind yeah um i don't know if in the u.s you can apply for that or not. Mm. I don't know. I, I That's one thing I never, you know, I really didn't cover that with Fran, um, but it's an interesting thing. But you, it's it's not like as an artist, it's not going to, you know, you're not sort of losing millions. What you gain on, yeah, it's not going to break you. Yeah, it's a song <laughs> right. list, right? So right. you make up your money anyway because you're selling your merchandise personally one-on-one -on -one and your CDs, you know, so... And you're not going to win yeah. that much from one night's set list. So no, no. I think the big thing about house concerts, you're really connecting with your fans. You're really making, I think, a solid bond. Yes, absolutely. And as long as you make sure that you get them on your email list while they're there, you can continue that bond. Yeah. And there's also the artist to artist bond. That's not to be mm. forgotten. Uh, Trisette met another artist called Fiona Joy and Fiona has won a Grammy award um, for her music. She's a classical pianist. And Fiona and Trisette met on at House Concerts Australia and ended up doing uh, a tour together um, of little house concert venues and on all sorts of things. And, and they're, they're lifelong friends now. They're, you know, so there's that bond as well. Artists meet other yeah. artists. So that's a, that's a good point. I mean, that's always a good idea to network with other artists because you never know what's going to come out of that. That's right. That's exactly. I mean, personally, you know, a great relationship as well as something business wise. Yeah, exactly. And also if you're, you know, if you're an artist and you're performing at a house concert, you can mention, you know, and the host says to you, oh, we'd love to have another one. And you're not able to do another one. You can suggest someone that, you know, you know, so right. you can help each other by just connecting with other artists as well, because that's what we're here to do. We're, that's what we're meant to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So the book that you were talking about, the pop stars and idols, is that? Can you get that on Amazon or? Yeah, you can. I want to definitely put a put a link to it on the show notes page. Yeah, aren't I slack? I should have said I, I forgot about my book. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot well, about it. But you um, can send me the link, or if I can, I can easily find it. Yeah, I'm sure. you can just Google it. It's just pop stars and idols, and I think like the end is a little ampersand pop stars mm. and idols. So it's not the word, okay. but you'll find it. It's the only book of its terrible title in the world, but it's got some great <laughs> information in there. I'm sure it does. I mean, all the years that you worked in management and watched everything that happened yeah. and really understand, like you said, all the cogs in the wheel. I can't imagine that there's, it's not like full of golden nuggets. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is. It's got, it's, it's got some good stories in it. That's for sure. Mm. You know. Yeah, that's probably worth its weight in gold there, the, the stories of the background stories on some stuff. And you know what? It hasn't changed that much. And I, yeah. I emphasize music publishing. Some things have changed. Yes, we have technology. 
Um, yes, it's you know a rising tide. A rising tide lifts all boats. I haven't made a cent from my music online in terms of record sales. I have not. But what I have found is that I googled my name and the number of radio stations that are streaming my stuff that I'd never known about, never heard of, was mm. a, a phenomenal. And wow. I thought, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to pull away from that and I'm going to just look at film and television and just, you know, these bodies that play air your music in, in coffee shops and restaurants and stuff. They cover thousands. So, yeah, that's right. my two cents worth. And house concerts. Awesome. <laughs> yes, definitely house concerts. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great talking with you. You've had so much, you know, just great knowledge across the board to share with us. How can our listeners connect with you? Okay. Um, well, there's a couple of ways. I have the House Concerts Australia website, which is all the W's, houseconcertsaustralia.ning.com. So there's no AU, just ning.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook at uh, Lisa J. Aston Music, but that's a really quiet page. Um, my website is Lisa J. Aston Music. Webs. Dot com, or you can email me at lisaj888 at gmail.com. Wow, even given out her email. Okay, you yeah, might get some no emails. One's email me. <laughs> no, they'll just. <laughs> you never know. No, I have had people from my show interview people, I mean, uh, email people directly. So you never know. Well, if anyone is touring Australia and, you know, wants to know about house concerts here, I'm here to help. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been great. I really appreciate talking to you and I know our listeners will learn so much from what you've had to say today. Oh, Bree, thank you very much for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. And I thank all your listeners for tuning in. And um, I hope that one of my little nuggets has been of value to somebody somewhere. I know it will. Thanks. Thanks, Bree. Now go out and make great music, connect with your fans and grow your business. Female Entrepreneur Musician has been brought to you by femusician.com and femalemusicianacademy.com. With editing by Jen Eads of 317 Sound Design and music by Stella Ronson.